of my talk this evening are two elephants in this room. The two elephants are financial crisis, and this is a copy of my book, No Where to Hide, where I wrote about financial crisis. And the next elephant is income distribution of inequality in the world and in many countries. In the world, 1,400 billionaires has wealth of 5.4 trillion US dollars, equivalent to US China's GDP, or 7% of the world's GDP held by 1,400 people. The United States has experienced now the worst inequality since they kept record in 1917. That is 10% of United States top population took home 50% of total income. Okay. My objective today is to show how these two events, which are so important, are related. They are very complex. Most people say, oh, economics is too much. Okay. But I'm going to try to explain economics and finance in simple terms because they affect your life and you must know what is happening so that you can understand what is happening, you feel empowered to act. So you might say, what can we do? The first thing you want to do anything is you have to understand the phenomena. And as I said, you know, so my purpose is to show you how these two are related. First elephant, Wall Street. I'm sure all of you know what it is. It's a big, big elephant, a dinosaur. It is so huge. It controls the world. It affects your life. Okay? It captures all the bright minds of the world. The young people love to go to Wall Street to make money. Okay? It has captured the government and it has captured the regulators who are supposed to regulate them. Okay? In fact, the world is held hostage by financial industry. Let me explain why. Because six years ago, and all of you certainly uh, older than six years, right? <laughs> we experienced the worst financial crisis since 1932. Okay? The world lost $34 trillion, not billion, $34 trillion, which is more than the half of the world's GDP. The world's GDP plunged, and we lost $5 trillion of world's GDP. Unemployment was incredible. 43 million people were thrown out of job in Europe and in uh, America, not including China, which I will come to later. Right? Now, US unemployment rate reached 10%. In fact, unofficially, it's 18%. In Europe today, the average unemployment rate is still 11%. And if you were young then, and living in Greece and Spain, unemployment among the youth is 50%. What does that mean? That means if all of us here were living in Spain and Greece, one out of every two of you will be out of a job. No matter whether you got a PhD and how educated you are, there just ain't enough jobs. Okay? So the question becomes, why did this happen? Oh, by the way, the China story, right? You know better than I do. Millions of workers had to leave the cities to go back to the country because exports plunge, factories close down. And some of you, you know, may know people whose life have been touched. So why did this all happen? Is it because there was a natural disaster? Is it because something bad happened to the real productive economy? No, it was driven by finance, which has become such a big elephant. And let me explain. Finance, instead of serving the real economy that is real business people like you and I, has become the master of the economy. It's controlling your life. And how does that happen? Right? Imagine, finance is a very important part of the real economy. And if you start a business, you need to have your own capital, but you also borrow from the bank. So credit is the lifeblood of a modern economy. And the role of finance is to bring to be the middleman between the savers and the borrowers. Correct? But what is happening over the last 40 years 
is finance is not interested in lending you any more money. Banks are not interested. They are more interested in buying and selling derivatives, currencies, financial products, trading, speculation, or in simple terms, du xian, gambling. Okay? That's what they are interested in doing. Okay? Banks have become banks that do not lend. Just think about it. You go to a bank, the bank says, I don't want to lend you money. And this is exactly what happened in Indonesia in 1998. Asia had the worst financial crisis, called the Asian financial crisis, which hit many, many countries. Okay? And I had the unpleasant, very unpleasant task to approach one of my clients, who was an Indonesian manufacturer of textiles and clothes overseas. And we were giving him credit for his trading. And then we, I told him, sir, I'm sorry. We cannot give you any more credit. And he was shocked. Why? Why me? I've been paying my bills on time. I've never defaulted. I've never missed a payment. Why are you not lending me money? And I had to tell him straight in the face, sir, I'm sorry. Our banks are not interested in lending anymore. We are more interested in trading currencies, trading yuan, trading rupiah, and all this stuff, because that's where we make money. Okay? And you want to know banks now are making more money doing all this kind of trading of currencies in the world the bank i mean the world only has 20 trillion dollars of trade in the world that means buying and selling goods you know tourism services and all that but the amount of foreign exchange trading and currencies is 1.3 quadrillion 1300 trillion 26 times the amount of real economic activities that is happening. So if they're not supporting the real economic activities, which are only 20, 30 trillion, what are they doing? The rest, right? Basically, that money is used for speculating. And you know, because luckily the yuan is more or less controlled, right? At about six uh, to seven yuan to a dollar. But if you go to an uh, Australian currency and, uh, and, and a yen and other countries, they're not controlled. It goes up one day and down another day. So you look at the next chart where in Indonesia that I was talking about, right? the Indonesian rupiah in a matter of months plunged from $1 to 2,500 rupiah to 15,000. My goodness, if you're a businessman, what are you going to do? Suddenly, you know, the rupiah is so cheap. If you want to buy, import certain things, then you have to now pay much more. So. You know, what is good for Wall Street is not necessarily good for us. But we go to the next slide where the banks are not only trading in currencies, they are trading in commodities, food, maize, corn, aluminium. We've seen huge volatility in those prices. And the reason is not simply because of supply and demand and natural disaster. A major part of the reason is because banks are speculating in it. They are buying these commodities, food and grain, and they are hoarding it. Worse still, they are buying storage space, transportation facilities, so that they can control the price you know, of the things that you eat. If you don't believe me, this was reported just a few months ago where Goldman Sachs has been sued by the government for inflating aluminium prices. How? They buy up huge storage space and they keep the aluminium there. And the price of aluminium goes up. And the price of you know, your, 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 your Coke bottle, uh, well, tin can goes up because this is happening. Okay? The bank is being sued. Next, we see JP Morgan, where I used to work. Okay? They were fined 410 million US dollars few months ago for what for speculating and manipulating electric prices in California and in Michigan so what I've shown you is that finance has become so big that instead of serving the real economy which is a tail it is wagging here the tail is wagging the dog that you know finance is wagging the real economy and I'm not the only one person saying it my former boss is another one of my former bosses you know, uh, Bob Diamond, he also said that, you know, it's 
too, too big to fail. You have to end this business. And currency trading is not the only one. Then they also come up with all kinds of financial products which I can tell you, which you will not understand, CDOs, CDS, you know, derivatives and all the stuff. But have they been actually very beneficial to us? Listen to what Paul Volcker had to say. He said since the 20, 30 years ago, the only important um, financial innovation is the ATM machine. All right? Now all the other stuff, listen to Warren Buffett. He says all the other derivatives are financial weapons of mass destruction, like a nuclear bomb. That's what it is. It's not me saying it, it's they saying it. Right. So I'm done with the first elephant. Let me go to the second elephant, inequality. Okay? This chart shows you that 1932, when they had a Great Depression, and 2007, when we had a Great Recession, inequality in the United States was at its highest level. 1% of the top 1% took home 20 to 25% of the total income. Next, you see that this is, again, you know, inequality in the US where I mentioned you know, the 10% took home 40%. And we have been fed with this myth for the last 40 years that you know, a rising tide lifts all boat. And it says, just concentrate on economic growth. You can be happy. Everybody will have benefit. But that's not the case. You know that and I know that. Okay? In China, right, and this is from the China news, what was happening is that the wage share of GDP has declined. What do I mean by that? It means that you know, the, the national income, how much goes to the workers in terms of wages and how much goes to capital in terms of profit, rental, uh, interest, right, and dividends. It went down from 57% 50, in China down to 37% in 22 years. That's the inequality that's happening. The same thing is ha happening in, 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 in the United States where this line the uh, orange-red line shows you that wages have been stagnating flat, whereas CEO space have gone up and down. Right. So, why is this happening? This is a very important chart. It shows you, the black line shows you labor productivity, how much labor is producing. Okay? The purple line shows you the wages, compensation per hour. What is showing you that between 1947 in the United States and 1975, as productivity increased, wages increased, which should be the case. But after 1975, look what happened. Productivity, labor productivity increased, but wages increased, but at a decreasing rate. So there was a big divergence. Same thing is happening in China. Look, China Labor Productivity Index, 1998, went from 100 to 100, right, when it started the same, went up, and wages went this way. This is the major cause of inequality, right? So now, think for a moment what this means. It means that, you know, if the economy is supposed to grow, people must have money, right, and wages to purchase. But if my wages are stagnating, how am I going to spend? Well, the bankers say there's only way to spend, to borrow, and the banks are very glad to lend you money. And that's exactly what happened in the US, right? The US household debt just went up. US household spending went up much faster than GDP. Okay? And that led to a debt bubble, right? Because you borrow, borrow to spend and led to debt bubble. On the other hand, there is an asset bubble. Remember, there's a small group of people with lots of money. They're not going to put their money in the fixed deposit in the bank and 1%. They want to put it in all these financial weapons of mass destruction, which gives them 20, 30%. And in stocks and bonds, which inflated the price of assets. So you had an asset bubble, you had a stock, uh, sorry, debt bubble. Eventually, we know the law of gravity will happen. The, both the bubble burst, and we had the great financial crisis. And that's how the two are related. So what do we do? Okay, by the way, uh, in China, while this was happening, 3,000 miles away, something is happening in China. It's a similar but different story. Similar in the sense that inequality was worse, but different because as US consumption went up, in China the consumption went down. 
This is the wage share coming down, consumption went down to 35% of the national income, which means that only you know, 35% of national income is consumption, which is equivalent to what the Europeans consumed during the war time. And all the money and saving, what happened? Basically, it went for export and to finance the debt bubble and the consumption of America. What an irony. The poor country financing the rich country. So what do we do? Right? Let's go on next. Well, this is another TED talk by Wilkinson. He stated in his talk that inequality is bad for social reasons. It get higher crime, mental illness, obesity, you get fat, you know, people lack trust. But what I've showed you is that inequality also leads to financial and economic instability. Now, what you can do to reduce some of this inequality is we must let wages rise with productivity. Remember the chart where it was going like that? Now we have to put them together. And that, some of that is happening in China today. And on the right side, we have to change the tax system. We have to we have more progressive tax. It means people who are earning more must pay more. Okay? And you must tax those people with capital gains, which means if they play stocks and, and, and shares and all that, they should be taxed. Finally, the last chart says that we must also control this big, big elephant. Okay? And this chart is not about New York, Manhattan skyline. This columns show the frequency of financial and banking crisis. Okay? What it shows that during this period, when finance was controlled in America, 1930s to 1970, you see very little financial crisis. You don't control it, financial crisis. And we have to live with that. So, you know, I hope that my lecture has essentially give you some idea you know, to understand what is happening in the world and that we should create a better world which Lawrence has talk, talked about, that new world is possible. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>